Okay. okay. This is an interview with uh, William Meyer, New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 9th of December, 2003, approximately 1.30 p.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? William H. Meyer, 1124-22, uh, Throgs Neck, New York. Okay. Um, do you, uh, could you tell me what your uh, high school or your educational background was prior to entering service? High school. High school, okay. Um, do you remember where you were and um, your feelings when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was on KP, Mitchell Field, New York. They gave me the afternoon off. I went home. We were living in New Jersey at the time. <clears throat> and then uh, I was visiting a friend, and of course it came over the radio, and uh, uh, we listened to it. And Then I went home, and uh, I went back to Mitchell Field. That was on the, um, of course, Pearl Harbor on the 7th. The war was declared on the 8th. On the 11th, uh, we moved to uh, Bowling Field, Washington. That was the 8th Pursuit Group. No, 33rd Pursuit Group. I had been in the 8th, and then I went to Armament School. And uh, when I came back, my squadron had gone to Iceland. So I was put into the 60th Pursuit Squadron of the 33rd Pursuit Group, which is now at Eglund Air Force Base in Florida. Okay, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? I, I enlisted shortly after my 18th birthday. Mm -hmm. And when was that? Uh, that would be the 24th of November in 1940. Okay. I had graduated from high school that year. Okay, now you went into the Army Air Corps. Why did you select the Army Air Corps? Uh, I was always interested in airplanes. Had you ever flown? I flew. My first flight was in a 1928 Curtis Robin. My second flight was in a, a Curtis Condor. Uh, that was at Teterboro, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. My mother and I both flew. Okay. Uh, where did you go for your uh, basic training? Well, we had no real basic training at Mitchell Field, mm -hmm. uh, they just moved, oh, I don't know, it must be several hundred of us into a hangar. And we, ha we had cots. And the basic training was not really very much, because I can remember we had a major in charge, and he'd go out on a bright, sunny day and say, looks like rain. Well, we won't have any drill today. <laughs> and after about uh, two weeks, they... Uh, moved us in the squad. They asked us what we wanted to do. I had been a, a rifle shooter as captain of the ri rifle team in high school and I thought well I think I'd like to go into armament and uh, which I did and uh, I was uh, I worked on P-40s, uh, P-39s back that would be in 1941. Mm -hmm. I went to armament school in April of 41, graduated in August that's when I returned and found my old outfit had gone to. Mm -hmm. Now uh, you I mentioned school. in your uh, the uh, interview form that you filled out that when you first went in you had World War One equipment, large amount of World War One uh, equipment. We uh, when I, I went overseas with World War One equipment, we had the World War One helmets for about a year because uh, I, I went overseas in January of '42 and uh, into the Pacific. Uh, as I found out a few years ago, we were headed for the Philippines mm -hmm. on the SS President Coolidge. Uh, I imagine they must have decided they'd never get a, a ship that size into the Philippines without being bombed by the Japanese. Mm -hmm. So we went down to uh, Australia, arrived there the 1st of February of 42. So you still were wearing the old style helmets? The old style helmets. And Put them in the old World War I gas masks. We, we had those. Okay. We had to carry with us because we never had to use them. Now, uh, when you arrived overseas, what, what did you do there? Well, I was part of what they, well, I have to backtrack again a little okay. bit. Uh, 
<clears throat> we went to Bowling Field, and then they called several of us in and said, you're going to be part of a team that turned out to be the Hamilton Field Combat Team, composed of uh, qualified armors, uh, um, mechanics, and pilots. Mm -hmm. And we went out, they put us on a train, and I can remember when we stopped at Denver, and we had to take turns eating in the dining car, and I had eaten early and, and got off and standing talking to some friends, and there were some draftees there, and they were looking at this private seating in the dining car. And this other fellow says, they're regular army. <laughs> <laughs> so and then we went up to uh, Seattle, and I, I don't recall the name of the army base there, and we stayed and didn't really do much until we left and, and were put on the President Coolidge and, and sail on the 12th. Uh, now, did you go in a single ship or a convoy? Well, we had uh, the Coolidge, the Mariposa, and, and uh, I think the we had a cruiser with us, um, the Los Angeles, which later was given to the Argentinians and sunk. I think the Argentinians had it, but... Uh, um, we had no problems going over mm -hmm. two meals a day, and uh, then we landed in Australia, and I don't really think they knew what to do with us. And they put us, this combat team, into this fourth air depot. We were there for a few days and shipped out, and uh, we were flown to Darwin, Australia. and. Um, we landed, we were there on the 17th of February. On the 19th, we were living in these tin shacks on the civilian airport. And we had some people on the uh, RAAF base. And uh, about 10.30 one morning on the 19th, a fellow says, hey, look, they're rat racing up here. And we're looking at these two planes are going at each other. And then one, then, then you could hear brrrr hey, they're fighting. And then uh, they started blowing sirens and so forth. We all got in slit trenches, which fortunately were there. And then we were dive-bombed and really threw grenades at us and they strafed us. And uh, one funny incident, we were down and uh, this, it was full. And I had my head next to this one guy's Tom Dawson a New Yorker from Port Chester, right next to his rear end, and he says, I got a fart. I says, go ahead, Tom, we're going to be dead in a minute anyway. But we were in the trenches for 45 minutes, and uh, then the first wave left. It was led by the man who led the raid on Pearl Harbor. Um, and then we thought, well, we better get together with the rest of our people because we're going to be invaded, and they could have. There was nothing to stop them. We had no arms of any type. So uh, as we were driving over to the, uh, we, we stole a truck and went over to the RAAF base. But on the way, we could see the trees blowing up in front of us. <laughs> so we ran and hit. And fortunately, uh, uh, they stopped before about 100 yards from us. And, uh, uh, but they, they sunk most of the ships in the harbor. Uh, they killed, oh, hundreds of people in the town of Darwin and uh, shot down all of our airplanes but one. So uh, we were getting ready to uh, get trucks because we thought we're going to have to uh, take off about over 1,500 miles of outback if we were invaded. Uh, fortunately, uh, we weren't, but I can remember going up opening a door of a truck and there was a guy in there and I didn't know whether he was asleep or dead but I was 19 years old I wasn't about to find out uh, but uh, nothing happened fortunately and the uh, um, so they moved us down uh, uh, well, about 50 miles south uh, to another base and we stayed there and we had nothing to do and then uh, 
the 27th bomb group came in that had been in the Philippines and they were brought to Australia in the end of 1941. No manuals for the plane, nothing. Uh, all they had was a, a gunner and a pilot. And so they said, you're in this 17th squadron of the 27th group. And the planes had synchronized guns, which we could do, but every airplane has a different method of synchronization of where the prop is. And, uh, uh, but we had a good mechanic on my plane, and we got them all in shape. But then they took them away, sent them to New Guinea, and I think all but one was shot down there. Uh, and then this 49th Pursuit Group came up, and we were dispersed into the 49th Group, and I was in the uh, 8th Squadron. Uh, then they changed it to 8th Fighter Group. Uh, or 8th Squadron, 49th Fighter Group. Uh, well, we were sent down to this other strip, and the first thing we did, we put up our tent um, with myself and a fellow named Frank Morawski, who was also from Albany, and a couple others, and we had uh, an Australian tent because it was better than ours. And How were they different from ours? Well, we had, they were, the shape was different. Mm -hmm. We, the America, we finally wound up with a 16-foot perimeter tent. So we put up our tent and started digging the slit trench. Well, these other guys had not been up there during the, uh, the, the uh, big raid. And the, uh, um, what are you doing? We're digging the slit trench. Why? <laughs> because they saved our life up in Darwin. Oh. And we want you guys to know if we're raided here and anybody gets in our trench, we're going to throw you out. So then, day by day, slit trenches appeared around uh, and they were used. Mm -hmm. uh, although we, I was never in a raid uh, that we had in, in, in Darwin uh, in February 19th. Uh, but the newspapers claimed in a minor raid on Darwin because they didn't want to scare the people, the Australians. And as if we were 1,500 miles from any civilization, really. So, uh, well, we stayed there, and uh, uh, our planes, we had P-40, P-40 East, which had three 50 caliber, or should caliber 50 machine guns, three in each wing. And uh, they learned Chenault, I guess they used Chenault's technique. And they used to say, one P-40 is not as good as a zero, but two P-40s are as good as six zeros. And we racked up uh, a great many victories with very few losses. Uh, then, and toward the end of 1942, they put us on... Uh, the Liberty ship, and we went to, to uh, Port Moresby. But what we had done is, some, when we lost some of our planes that would crash or they would uh, two shot up the fly, we'd take the guns out and, and take the armor plate out, and we, we made 18 sets of twin 50s. And they asked the captain of the, the ship, would you mind if we put these 18 sets of 50s around the deck. Oh, no, no, go right ahead. And uh, we never had to use them, never had any problem. And uh, we went to uh, Port Moresby, and then we were at a, another base. I think I was, they used, I was at 12 Mile. Was, and uh, they raid quite a bit, and, but they never came out to where we were. And, and they come in at night, and it was just like a football game. We're cheering because they had spotlights. They never really shot down anybody, but we were always cheering them. And um, then uh, we, it had been so long, I can't remember whether we went over to Dobadura across the Owen Stanley Range first, but <clears throat> they decided to make uh, a new fighter group, the only fighter group ever formed overseas. And, uh, oh, I forget the name of the general 
that was his fighting group. And so they sent us down to Brisbane, Amberley Field, and uh, we formed this new squadron. It was half people who had been there for a year and a half, and, and the rest of the squadron were new people that came in from the States, and uh, we got the P-38s, which of course is a fine aircraft. Well, <coughs> they got checked out and that, and then uh, we went back up to uh, Tobadura, and, uh, which is near Oro Bay, where they, they used to bomb that quite a bit. But uh, uh, I was on the advance party, and so we thought, let's live a little better. And we're the first ones there, so we uh, cut down these small palm trees, and we raised our tent three feet off the ground. And then we'd split the, the trees using a machete, and that was our floor. And then we'd have the flaps out, and, and that was pretty good living. And then when the rest of the outfit came in, the uh, group commander saw our tent. I want all the tents in, in the group like that. So we weren't too popular because <laughs> you, know, you, you run out of the bamboo pretty fast. But... Uh, uh, so we were there, and um, we had a, a, one of the pilots that came over from the 49th group was uh, a, a captain, um, uh, I know his name as well as mine, who, who um, Thomas B. McGuire, Jr., who wound up as the second-ranking ace in the war th with 38 aircraft. Uh, he wasn't a very pleasant guy, but he loved to fly combat. That's all he wanted to do, fly combat. And, and of course, when they come back, we'd all be out there and, and the pilots would come back at McGuire one time, four held up four fingers, he got four. And, and uh, um, oh, as armors, we were, of course, responsible for sighting in the guns. And we'd set them to, we had a, a a jack we set into the ground and we put the nose wheel on the jack, set it one degree nose down, which was the attitude of the aircraft at 300 miles an hour. And we would fire the guns in at a one foot group at 300 yards. So you had four 50 caliber machine guns and uh, a 20 millimeter cannon. Well, one time, we had just finished shooting in one plane and towed it back, and we had an alert. Pilot comes rushing out, gets in, and he came back and he told us, in fact, over the air, he said he had one shot at a zero, and he said the concentrated fire just completely blew that airplane back apart. And then he said, that's for the boys in the armored shop. <coughs> and we were very fussy about how what we did to the guns. You know, they were always... We didn't have many planes come back where they say that the guns didn't fire or this. And we used to take the ammunition out of boxes and, and we had a little gadget to put it in, make sure that they were all seated properly and the metal disintegrating belt links. Uh, so um, we stayed there and as the infantry would advance, we would always be the first fighter group in behind them. Uh, we were in delay. And um, let's see, we, um, Hollandia, and um, I was on the advance party there too, and we had this major in charge. He said, nobody leaves their tent at night because there are Japanese all over the place. And uh, as a matter of fact, he saw a shape one night in his tent. And the same thing with the Japanese, and he just shot right through the mosquito net, killed him, and found out the guy was probably just looking for food. Uh, but anyway, we, we were in Hollandia for a while, then we went up into the Dutch East Indies, the, the island of Biak, uh, and we were there putting up our tents, and Colonel Archibald Roosevelt came down with a couple of his sergeants, who are you people? It's 431st Fighter Squadron, 475th Group. Uh, what are you doing here? We're putting up a tent. Do you know where you are? Well, we're on the island of Biak. 100 yards up there at the front lines. Don't leave. 
So uh, if, uh, the 41st Division, Infantry Division, was there. And uh, oh, this is one little story out of school. But I got to know this tech sergeant. He'd been offered a, a commission, but he would have had to stay. So he said, I'll, I'll go home a live tech sergeant instead of a dead second lieutenant, because they're the first ones that would get knocked off. And they set up a little rest area, and he was telling me, he said, um, boy, if we only had a generator so I could get electricity here. And I said, well, can you get a Jeep t tonight? He said, yeah, why? I said, we'll get you a generator. So we went down. I stole a generator from one of the other squadrons. And he says, you'll never recognize this in a couple of days. So uh, uh, they, we figured the infantry deserved like that, uh, something like that. So anyway, we had what we call the world shortest bomb runs. Uh, we had B-24s and P-38s. The B B-24s would take off, turn left out of the pattern, come in on a downwind leg, drop their bombs, and come around and land. And they were never out of the traffic pattern. But they were bombing caves. And what they used to do, too, some of the caves, they'd, they'd pour gasoline down. The Japanese, they get Japanese gas, they pour it down, and they'd throw in a hand grenade and suffocate or burn who's ever in the cave. Um, and then they had started... Uh, rotation. And I think I was on the fifth rotation home. I got down to uh, this base in, Aust in, in New Guinea uh, to wait transportation and I picked up uh, oh that's a trouble when you're 81 years old you forget some of these things. Uh, but anyway, I wound up in a hospital for 10 days, and then they got out, and uh, all my people and my records had been shipped home, so they shipped me home on a hospital ship. And we, we got back to the same base in, in Seattle, and uh, we got off and went to the base, and we wanted to have something to eat. <clears throat> and my sergeant said, uh, you guys were supposed to be fed on the ship. Well, we weren't. Well, he said, I haven't got anything but hot dogs. So they prepared a bunch of hot dogs for us, and everybody said, boy, these are great. At first he thought we were kidding, but that was the first good meal we'd had in, 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 in quite a while. So uh, uh, finally he's going around and smiling. And, uh, he yelled at one of the cooks, get those apple pies out. Well, Sergeant, you were going to save them for tomorrow. No, these guys need them. So... Uh, uh, Oh, one thing I forgot. We did have, when I was uh, in, uh, had been in New Guinea, I guess up the end of 1942, they gave us uh, 10 days leave in Australia. And uh, that was good. Oh, that was the only one uh, that I had. And, and we never saw any white women. Uh, I guess probably a year and a half that we were there. But the, when I came home, and then they, they shipped us all back, uh, and I was, um, had a 30-day leave, and then uh, I had to go down to Richmond Army Airfield where they sent single Air Force or Air Corps people. The married people would go to uh, um, down there in Jersey, what, uh, the hotel. Yeah, another slipped my mind. But anyway, um, so I had my 30-day leave, and, my, and my, my mother said, well, I'm going to go over to New York with you to the train. So we go over, and we're sitting there. Of course, I'm in uniform, and, and uh, this woman came up and said, oh, you're most lucky to have your son home. My son has been in England for a year and a half. My mother drew herself up to her full five-foot two and said, well, my son just got back from three years in the South Pacific, and it's got, oh, <laughs> took off. Well, we got, got into uh, uh, Richmond Army Airfield, and we were there 10 days awaiting orders. And 
well, while we were uh, there, we had nothing to do. They had a little stack bar that was open for us any time, and, and there was very little to do in Richmond except go to the OC, o, uh, OS, no, what am I thinking? USO. USO, USO. <laughs> thank you. And uh, that's where I learned to dance. There was a, a uh, she was a, 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 um, a writer for the Richmond Times Dispatch, and she taught me how to dance, and I was like, what, 22? So, uh, um, then, then uh, I was reassigned down to Eglin Field, Florida, and they put us on the train, and uh, I happened to be up front and went in and sat down, and, and then they said, uh, uh, we've made arrangements for you people to eat. So I'm first out, first back, and on the way back in the car, this forward of ours, uh, I saw this girl I'd gone to school with, high school, who was a runner-up the previous year to Miss America, so you could know what she looked like. So, so oh, you know, sit down, and she's holding my hand and talking, you know, all this. And the, as the people started coming back, and they they saw me, they, uh, mm. <laughs> but they went uh, went back, and so when I went back to the car, they said, "Who was that?" beautiful gal you were talking to. I said, oh, it's the best looking girl I could find on the train. So I, this one, one guy said, buddy, he said, I've seen some operators in my time. She, you couldn't have been sitting there five minutes and she's over close holding your hand. <laughs> oh, well, I said, you know how it is. <laughs> so then we got down to, uh, uh, I was said, going to Eglin uh, Field and then you always have to process in. Well, as I'm sitting there, I start to shake. And the guy said, get down to the hospital. So I, I went in and I had four attacks of malaria in the month I was in the hospital. Uh, they, uh, trying something new, let the fever burn itself out. But uh, uh, it would, but in this, as soon as you got up and started moving around, why? Um, it, I, I got hit again. So, but it was very comfortable and nice. I had a private room and the nurses would come in at night and write letters to their boyfriend and I always had a fresh bowl of fruit and the doctor would, he'd come in in the morning and, how you doing, Sergeant? And I said, oh, you know, I'm doing fine, doing fine. He says, you know, you're the only one in, in this bay that's uh, in a ward that's sick. And the only one that doesn't complain. Well, I think that was good strategy because <laughs> I was taken care of. But the one time I'm up and walking around, and if you were ambulatory, they gave you a little job. So they gave me some little thing to do. But the doctor came in, what are you doing up? Well, I said, uh, what are you doing working? I said, well, I'm, I'm ambulatory. Go back to your room. And he told the ward boy there, said, he doesn't do any work. So I was in the hospital a month. And uh, I got out and, and went to this gunnery training section F, which is uh, on a, uh, one of their satellite bases, one squadron. And uh, what the base did, they were training and pilots who had just graduated in gunnery. Um, some of them were not very good. So I can remember like a pilot would come out to fly with, they're flying AT-6s. And uh, you go up to the pilot and say, now, Lieutenant, I made a mistake. I put an extra 50 rounds in each gun. There were two synchronized 30 caliber machine guns. Uh, if you like, I'll take them out or maybe just fire a longer burst. Well, they knew that we were <laughs> trying to help them get through. Well, they didn't have an officer's club or an NCO club. It was just a, a little beer bar. And the mechanics could never figure out why the pilots were always buying the armor's beer because <laughs> we were getting them through school. Well, uh, come May of 45, the uh, uh, war was over in Europe and they came out with what they call, uh, well, they showed us a movie, Two Down and One to Go. 
in which they were going to, they had a, a point system, they were going to start demobilizing. Uh, and if you had 80 points, you were eligible to get out. Well, I had 107 points. You had a point for every month in the service, a point for every month overseas, five points for every decoration. And so I had 107 points, so I was eligible, and I was in the States because there were a lot of people overseas who were eligible but didn't get to come back. So uh, they called me in, do you want to get out? Yes, uh, which at the time I thought was right. So I, uh, I got out the 28th of May of 45, and then I had to go register for the draft because I, of course, had never registered. And I went into the local draft board and I said, I want to uh, register for the draft. How old are you? And I said, 22. And you never registered for the draft? I said, no. And this young lady there said, why not? I said, we didn't have a draft board down New Guinea. <laughs> and uh, how did you get out? I said, I got out in the point system. Watch that. She didn't know. She said, could you back, come back? This, this was around lunchtime. Could you come back this afternoon when the men are here? <laughs> I think maybe they know about it. So I, I, uh, I, I uh, uh, went and I registered for the draft. And I was out a year. I went to a college for a year. Uh, my father was on real in real estate law on Wall Street every day, three-piece suit, back and forth, hot or cold. I said, this is not for me. I said, after I finish this year of college, uh, I said, I'm going back in. And I did. And I never regretted it. I said, I'd never make a lot of money. But I said, I'll enjoy so I, uh, I went back in and uh, I was down, sent down to Fort Dix for reassignment. <clears throat> and in order to get stripes back, I had to re-enlist for overseas. But we all had to be interviewed by an Air Force liaison officer. So when my turn came and uh, we're talking, he said, you look familiar. I know you're from somewhere. So we started backtracking. And we'd been in recruit training together. And he said, I see you signed up for overseas. You want to go? I said, no, I don't want to go. Well, he said, I'll send you up to Mitchell Field for reassignment in the States. So I said, well, that's great. So I go back to the barracks and, and uh, the everybody, you know, where are you going? Where are you going? And I said, I'm going to Mitchell Field. How did you get Mitchell Field? Well, I didn't want to tell what really happened because they'd all be running over. So I said, gee, I was just sitting there. And the captain had my Form 20 in his hands, uh, hand, and he, uh, he got a call, uh, and uh, they needed an armorer at Mitchell Field. So he says, hey, you want to go? And I said, sure. I said, so I went up to Mitchell Field. Well, I was reassigned out to probably the worst base I was ever on, the Smoky Hill Army Airfield, Salina, Kansas. We had stoves in the barracks. And if the stoves went out at night, the butt cans would freeze. The latrines were outside. Uh, so uh, stayed there. And, oh, of course, when I went out, you always have to be interviewed again. So there was this major, and he said, you know, we have so many armors. Uh, I do have an opening in the photo lab. Oh, I said, well, I'd, I'd rather be an armor. So I went out, and I saw the sun beating down on these B-29s in the summertime, in August of uh, 46. I went running back. I said, hey, Major, is that job still open in a photo lab? And he says, yeah. I said, okay, I'll be a photographer. So uh, one of the fellows that went to Smoky Hill with me had graduated from uh, civilian photo school. So we go into the uh, photo lab, and he said, don't tell anybody you don't know anything about photography. When we go out on a, on a job, you go with me and I'll teach you. So then I, I also put in for uh, photo school at Lowry Air Force Base uh, in Denver, and that came through. So I, I went to be, I was a ground photographer and a photo lab technician, and I did that. <clears throat> And uh, then we moved down to El Paso, uh, Biggs Air Force Base, and the uh, 
uh, I got a call from this sergeant at wing headquarters and, and he said, uh, we have an opening for one man to go to aerial photo school. And I said, I'll go. He said, well, get permission from the photo officer. I said, it's TDY. Get permission from the NCOIC. I said, I am the NCOIC. Come on down. So off I go. I went through uh, aerial photo school at Denver and uh, came back. And uh, I, of course, I was in this, went back in the same outfit. And then when I, uh, my hitch was up, I put in to go up to uh, um, McGuire Air Force Base where they had a, uh, a, a recon group. And, well, it's a long story how I got in there, but I got in. Uh, uh, but we, I got up there. They wanted to put me back in armor. We have too many aerial photographers. So this had to tell us, Captain, I said, well, all right, Captain, uh, put me back in armor, <clears throat> which I haven't done in years, uh, until my transfer comes through. He says, you can't transfer out of this outfit. I said, when I, when I tell my father that the Army or the Air, what is the, it was the Air Force then, spent $5,000 sending me to aerial photo school and they're going to make me an armor. I said, he'll get me a transfer. What's your father do? I said, he's on Wall Street. <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, hmm, how did you get here? And I said, well, major so-and-so, there's a friend of mine down in, in Texas, uh, said he was a good friend of a Colonel Corbin up here. And, oh, hmm, hmm well, <laughs> I wound up as an aerial photographer, and uh, I was a photo gunner on an RB-50, and had uh, 1,200 hours on that aircraft. And then they started uh, uh, changing these RB-50s into, the, they were going to have furnished the B-47s. So aer aerial photographers weren't needed, so I got transferred up to uh, Spokane, a Fairchild Air Force Base, and uh, uh, we they had the GRB-36s that are the only 10 aircraft like it in the Air Force. And they were remodeled to, to take a, a, an F-84F into Bombay. In other words, I'll show you the pictures, how they would drop a, a boom, and then the, the or no, it would like be this, the pilot would fly in, catch uh, this hook on the boom, then they lower the boom and catch on the two s steel rods coming out and they haul it up. The pilot could get out and uh, we could refuel it <coughs> with 500 pounds or 500 gallons of gas. And, but I don't think any of us really believed that, that they'd ever was really a worthwhile project and, and uh, it wasn't so about all we did, we'd fly photo recon missions. I had the whole forward Bombay, and I had 14 cameras in, in the Bombay. Um, we would fly missions of 20 hours, 19 hours, but uh, we had two photographers, and uh, we could take turns lying on the bunk. And then I used to cook i bring a hot plate. I'd cook hamburgers and bacon and eggs and stuff like that. We also had frozen foods that we, we had an oven in the rear compartment. And, uh, but I, I preferred cooking my own. And so then uh, they phased out that aircraft and they called the photographers in, I think, one at a time. And they said, uh, well, <clears throat> If you're on flying status, they like to keep you on flying status because you're all, you don't have to be retrained. And he said, you can either be a tail gunner on a B-52 or a boom operator on the uh, rare air refueling, or you can be a loadmaster. Well, I was single, and I said, I had enough of this stuff taken off flying 20 hours and come back and land, and they call that a local mission. So... Uh, uh, I said I'll be a loadmaster, so I, they put me down in this squadron, the second SSS Strategic Support Squadron with C-124s, and, and then I went to uh, 
uh, loadmaster school for about six weeks and came back and then the whole outfit moved to Florida, uh, Pine Castle down in uh, um, Orlando. Uh, and then uh, if you're single, you're always eligible for transfer. If you're married, you have to stay at a base at least a year. So they called three of us in again and said they need three loadmasters, one in Japan, two in Hawaii. So I was ranking man. So I said, oh, I'll take Japan. They've never been to Japan. And the other two guys went to Hawaii. And then uh, I went uh, uh, to Japan, and then I was looking for something to do because I, I was never the type to hang around in bars. So uh, they had a rifle club and a team, and uh, I went over and uh, talked to this captain, and he let me shoot his rifle. He says, oh, yeah, we want you to shoot. So I, I wrote a letter to a friend of mine in Jersey who owned a gun store. I said, Paul, send me the best 22 target rifle you have, which he did. And then I shot uh, for the local team. And then uh, they sent me one time from Tachikawa, Japan, near Tokyo, to San Antonio, Texas, just to fire in this rifle match. And so I, I took uh, what they call a delay in route coming back. <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, I uh, went up to visit my girlfriend in Kansas, in uh, Leavenworth, Kansas. So uh, I got there and she said, uh, I didn't tell the boy, she was a widow. Her pilot husband had been killed. And uh, uh, I didn't tell the boys, but we're going to take them up to uh, Denver to go th for a, a, a summer camp. And uh, so we did that. And then I made the bunks for them, military style, and they would just slide in and slide out the, the uh, I think, the two weeks that they were there. And uh, they, when I met them, they were four and five, and now they're 56 and 57, and we're still in touch. I, in fact, I was down visiting both of them. Uh, but, well, let's see. Now what does a loadmaster do? Loadmaster your... is in charge of loading. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to do the physical uh -huh. work. You tell people, for example, when I was in Japan, we had the Japanese workers, and I'd say, Papa-san, I want two thousand pounds there. Put three thousand there. Give me ten thousand pounds in this area, and uh, then you would figure out the the weight and balance. Uh, <clears throat> you had to balanced is close to 20, what we call 27 percent of the uh, MAC, a mean aerodynamic cord. Because if you loaded it was tail heavy or nose heavy, then they'd have to crank in trim uh, and then you would, uh, uh, of course you're going to burn more fuel. Mm -hmm. But say if we were dropping something from the army, they'd have it all rigged and they'd move it in, but then the loadmaster would tie it down with chains. We had 10,000 pound chains, 15,000 pound chains, 5,000 pound straps. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, it was interesting. You never knew what you were going to have. And, and, and we also did uh, heavy equipment drop. We dropped road graders. We, we used to drop a lot for the Army test board. Uh, we would drop paratroopers. Must have dropped, dropped thousands of paratroopers. Never saw one hesitate. I'll go out. Um, but it was, it was an interesting job. Um, so I did that, and then uh, I had been frozen in rank for eight years as a tech sergeant because what they did in the Air Force, if they had too many master sergeants in one job, they'd just freeze it. Well, uh, um, aerial photographer was frozen, and... Uh, Loadmaster was frozen, but it, I didn't mind as much because I, I liked to fly. But then it finally opened up in 1960, and the CO said, uh, 
they, they base a lot on your efficiency report. So he said, write your own efficiency report. So I wrote my own, uh, and, and I gave it to the, the NCO of the IC of the section. He said, boy, that's good. Mine's due next month. How about writing mine? <laughs> I said, sure, Al. So uh, uh, I went in, went in, they sent 15 names in, and I went in number one on the base. I knew, I knew the captain who was on a promotion board, and, and so I got promoted. And then the first sergeant died, and the CO said, I want you to be the first sergeant. I said, well, as long as I can stay on flying status, all right, you're acting first sergeant. So I did that for a year, and uh, then I decided to retire. And I think uh, I, I checked the ed education department in the base and found out I was still eligible for the GI Bill. So I said, I think I'm going to get out, go to college, and then I'll teach. So I put in, uh, I had finished shooting in the national matches, was visiting my aunt in Cooperstown, and uh, I was telling her what I wanted to do, and she said, where are you going to school? I said, I don't know, I'll have to find one. Oh, they have a great one down in Albany. And so I went down there, and the only person I ever wound up talking to was the director of admissions. So, uh... I got in through him. My serial number, the student number, was 62001. So I, I went through Albany State in uh, three years and graduated on a Friday, and then I was at Shaker High for 23 years. And uh, after I got my master's degree, I started teaching part-time at Albany State, St. Rose, and uh, uh, Russell Sage. And <clears throat> so at, when I had 23 years, I was 60, 65. Oh, in the meantime, I got married. <laughs> to, to, to a, a woman I met in, in, uh, at college, and she was going back to finish her degree. She wound up, she was a, a senior parole officer for the state, and she had two children who were 14, the boy was 14, the girl was 17, and we got along great. Um, but uh, my wife died this be seven years ago in February, and uh, but we we had a good marriage and and uh, I got all the well my daughter stepdaughter died, and uh, but my stepson every time there's a party um, I go over there with them and uh, uh, so the last about all I do now is if I want to take off and go. I bought a Chrysler minivan two years ago, uh, October, and I've got 50,000 miles on it. I'll just take off and drive for six, seven thousand miles shooting pictures. And, uh, and here I am. <laughs> now in your uh, interview form you said that uh, you like to be with flyers. Right. I like to be, yeah, I like to be around the kind of people that fly airplanes. And I, my best friend is, uh, uh, was a pilot, he's got 11,000 hours. He was, he flew in the, uh, uh, he was a C-47 pilot during the mm -hmm. war. Then he got out and he was a corporate pilot and then he was with the FAA. And uh, he's a... Uh, just a year, a year older than I am, and, and we do everything together. He and his wife kind of adopted me after my wife died. And, uh, but yeah, the, those are the kind of... I feel closer to the military, really, than I did to teachers. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, your lives are interdependent when you're flying. And uh, we... Uh, one case, we took off from Puerto Rico in an RB-50, which was a hopped-up B-29, and on takeoff, we lost an engine. So uh, we were 20,000 pounds, or I think it was 10 or 20,000 pounds overweight for landing. <clears throat> so the uh, pilot, Captain Smith, said, uh, we're going to have to bore holes till we get our weight down. 
uh, an hour later we lost another engine and on the same side and that a little bit ticklish so he said uh, I can't maintain altitude we've got to go in anybody want to bail out nope no why do I we want to bail out we trusted him and uh, just went in landed and that you know you have that trust in people and mm -hmm. the kind of people I like not that I dislike teachers. Mm -hmm. Some of my best friends up here are teacher, retired teachers. But and you said you had an unusual duty with JFK in. Uh, oh, uh, when I was at, uh, I was stationed, in when I came back from Japan, uh, I was stationed in Tennessee, and we had a C-130 aircraft, same ones at, at Schenectady, mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, they called in, they wanted four C-130 aircraft uh, to take Kennedy. Just, well, we didn't. He went by Air Force One. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have pictures here. We, we, uh, um, we took the, uh, the two limousines and the Secret Service Cadillac and a few extra little things, and we flew them. We went to Puerto Rico, and then we went to Macuto in Venezuela, and uh, uh, then uh, into Bogota, Colombia, uh, and it was it was a interesting flight because well you got to know the Secret Service. I had a Secret Service man on a plane, and he told me all sorts of stories about what it was like. You know, they their average day was fourteen hours, mm -hmm. and uh, when we came back and uh, landed, he said. Uh, well, they gave us each the PT boat tie pen that Kennedy, you know, used to uh -huh. hand out. And uh, he said, we used to use the Navy, but you two loadmasters have given us more cooperation than we've ever had. And if you wish, you can make every presidential flight. We will request you by name, rank, and serial. We had four airplanes, but two of them just went. We never saw them again because they were back up. And I said, Dick, I said, that's great, except I'm going to retire next <laughs> month. So, uh, uh, but that was interesting. Mm -hmm. They say I have pictures there of... Uh, How about telling us about these two oh, pictures? If, well, if you just hold it up to the camera, like, no, no you, oh, you can hold it right there. Yeah. Well, this, other, this one, uh, we were getting ready to fly, and I had uh, my... A harness on. I used a chest pack because uh, the the RB50 was so crowded with cameras and and the gun turret that uh, uh, I couldn't wear a backpack. The difficulty with that it was only 28 feet, which made you come down faster. Mm -hmm. uh, and this this is the uh, the, the RB50. This is the in inside. And I was uh, going to take some uh, pictures, I think, on the prime vertical. But we didn't have nearly as many cameras on this plane as we had on the RB-36. I had the whole compartment. It was almost like this whole room. Uh -huh. uh, and it, uh, we had 14 cameras. And I had my own panel that I worked with. And, uh, and one thing, we always had a lot of good clothing. I think this was real fur. Mm -hmm. for did you ever do any uh, with these planes? Did you ever name the planes or anything like oh, that? Oh, I have or? a picture here. That plane there that uh, you'll see, our co-pilot, uh, Lieutenant Lennox, was from New Orleans. So we, we, we decided, we called the plane the Bella Bourbon Street. And we had a, we had a, a fellow come out, civilian came out, and he painted the, this uh, on, on the uh, on the aircraft. Now, when were these taken? This was taken. Could have been around. Uh, well, it would be 1950. 1950. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any other things to show us? Any other well, photographs? Did you have any? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, now here, these are small pictures. 
You can have these. These are all pictures at Iwo Jima. Uh, Mount Suribachi. Uh, we used to go down our station in Japan. We would send two aircraft down to Iwo Jima, and then we would uh, there would be two of our other ones there. We'd go down a week at a time, mm -hmm. and we would transfer 36, we call them bird cages, but they were 36 cage, well, they were like a cage about so big, and right in the middle was a ball of lead where they had the um, components for nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. and we At Iwo Jima, nobody else could land on Iwo Jima unless probably they came in an emergency, but we would stay, we had... Each aircraft had two crews, and so uh, 24 hours we would have to stay right in the barracks. Um, and then we had 24 hours off, and there's pictures in there where the, the, of the, some of the caves mm -hmm. and, and the beaches. And uh, uh, Now when were these taken? The those would be 19, probably about 1958. I've never have seen that, that memorial on... Oh, that's right on, oh, this. No, they, just some guys had carved it in there. It's, I don't know if they were Marines or. Uh -huh. Now that's on Iwo Jima itself. I've never seen that before. Yeah. Well, the real memorial is on the top of Suribachi. Yes, yes. Uh, and, of course, I took pictures. And then uh, there's one, one in a cave, what I have one here. Oh, well, this is, well. I'll show you those there. I'll show you something right there. Uh, this, <coughs> this picture is um, the, I think that's Kennedy's limousine. Yeah. When, and this particular picture was taken in Puerto Rico. And the people around here are all, let's see, is this the one? Oh yeah, this this is me here. And the, the rest of the people are Secret Service. But we could do anything. In fact, they, they let my other loadmaster friend drive that, just, you know, to say he could, he could uh, drive it. And let's, you know, I got some more from down here. Oh, uh, this is another shot. This was, they were shot, I think I shot these in black and white. Yeah. And these are copies of slides. And that was Kennedy's, that the, of course, the, the car that he, he was killed in. Oh, that's the car he was killed in? Yeah, yeah. But I don't think, see, uh, and down there, South America, they had the, the glass or the plexiglass mm -hmm. over it and uh, I thought I had these in line but uh, where oh it's with this is the other plane when we, we were flying in the C-130 and we, we went down pretty near in formation. And then, uh, this is the plane, the, the car I had, this one that Eisenhower had. Let's see if, uh, hey. And this is, there's another picture of it. Okay. And, and I, did I sh show you this one? Yeah. I think I showed you. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Kennedy's car. That's a, a, a duplicate. Oh, this was a, 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 a kind of a cute shot. This was taken in Bogota, Colombia, of a... Uh, Colombian holding his daughter with the American flag. I always kind of thought mm -hmm. that was cute. And if now you took all these photographs. Oh yeah, yeah. And this is uh, just.
just the people were all lined up and then they had signs welcome uh, Mr. Kennedy or President Kennedy um, oh here, here this is from a slide the slide was 60 about 62 years old and this is where on the island of Biak they said this is going to be a camp area so we had to chop all that stuff down we always each had machetes uh, oh, this is a, a larger version of that small oh, yes. one where they had carved this on and whitewashed it and a lot of them had, it was very soft uh, rock. Yeah, let's, oh, well, this is a picture of... The Japanese had fully intended to invade Australia, and uh, I don't know what I ever did. I had the original of this, where uh, a one-pound note, which incidentally, when we landed in Australia, we could have, we could get a steak and egg dinner for one and six, which was twenty-five cents, mm. and because the, the waitresses loved the Americans because they would tip as much as the meal cost. Uh, Okay, we're down to less than a minute. Oh, okay. Well, this is a, a picture of on the B-36 shooting on what we call the oblique, uh, and this was all uh, optical glass. I think at that time each piece of the glass was fifteen hundred dollars. This was uh, on the two. Okay, that's it. Okay, dope. Thank you. Well, I'll. Uh,